Hey, I'm Zach, Johnny's producer on his podcast, Masters of Wealth. Today on the show, Johnny's sitting down with Garrett Gunderson, a New York Times bestselling author and the founder of Wealth Factory, a financial education program for entrepreneurs all over the country. Garrett's a sharp guy, and he definitely knows his way around a dime. So stick around to hear about his glory days as a small town teen with his own car wash, his investment in the value equation, and what exactly it means to own your true definition of wealth. Hello, this is Johnny Wimbry. Welcome back to the Masters of Wealth show. I'm super ex- excited about today's episode. I get to interview a giant of success. Not only is he a giant of success, he's a giant in creating other success stories around the world just by simply sharing his expertise, which he's going to bring to the show today. I'm your host, Johnny Wimbry, and today we have the one and only Garrett Gunderson. He is a cash flow specialist. Um, he's a New York Times bestseller of the book killing sacred cows welcome to the masters of wealth garrett what's up johnny good to be here man i'm incredibly honored to have you on the show where are you right now salt lake city utah uh, <laughs> so this is uh, one of my offices that's in my house where i do a lot of like my writing and stuff like that but it's got a better internet connection than any other office i have so i want this to be high quality <laughs> we gotta have to make sure everybody hears this stuff you know i feel you brother trust me i feel you man so all the way from Salt Lake, I'm in Dallas, Texas. Um, I have an international following just like you do, so I know that many people around the world will be watching this. And uh, we'll just um, you know, take it right from the top. What was your inspiration to step into the financial world? I want to go back because a lot of times you know, people talk about where they are right now, and that's cool. Um, but I like to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly to make it real- realistic for the listeners and the watchers. Man, when I was a kid, I, I just wanted to get out. I lived in this small coal mining town. And so at, in my world back then, Salt Lake City seemed like a big city. Like I, I was that small of a town. And uh, I thought that if I could get rich, then people would just look at me as uh, intelligent. Like a part of that came from when I was a little kid and made a mistake and then just felt like crap about it. And I was like, oh, how, how do I prove people that I'm smart? And money was kind of the way. Now, when I was 18, I started to invest money. Before 18, my mom wouldn't sign off as a custodian. And then I got off an internship when I was 19, which sounds cool, but it was basically me peddling products like mutual funds and yeah. life insurance and the standard fare. But it at least got me kind of like introed into it. And uh, when the market started to go down in 2000 and my clients started losing money, I started asking better questions. And that's when I went on like a 26 month journey flying somewhere every month to interview people to figure out how things really work. I knew it wasn't this notion of high risk equals high return or it takes money to make money. All that kind of cliched garbage I was being told. And so fortunately I wasn't married. I had enough money, um, you know, because I had a business uh, when I was 15 years old and saved up. And so I just really invested in myself and increasing my financial. You know what I love about that, Garrett, is the fact that you got passionate about something and then you participated in the rescue of where you wanted to go. I, I really struggle with this as a success coach, as a speaker, as an author, you know, I I, like you, I travel around the world, man, and and you're on stages. And, you know, when you're on stage and you bring impact to individuals, they confess things to you that they don't even confess to their parents or their wives or husbands or people that are, that they're attached to. And here's what I find, man. Everybody wants to be successful. That is not unique. I don't care if you're in Singapore, Adelaide, Australia, um, New, you know, New Zealand, uh, you know, South Africa, Singapore, I mean, just all over the world, people just want to be successful and they think that makes them unique. But what you did was you got your ass on an airplane and started moving around and you invested like emotionally, psycho- you know, psycho- you know, just so many different ways, not even just financially, but you invested your time to research what you wanted out of life. And I've heard you say this before um, that you uh, you had a car wash. As a yeah, teenager. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Unique we got a lot of Eric Gunderson's car care, man. It was nothing, you know, it was just like just detailing cars, scrubbing bugs. I did eventually hire some employees, but uh, yeah, I, I was uh, just a miser and saved a, uh, a decent amount of money as a kid doing that. So where would you say your entrepreneurial spirit came from? Well, my grandfather uh, was kind of like a, he was a coal miner, but on the side he had two entrepreneurial pursuits. One is, he used to repair and sell Xena TVs, They're like a big hunk of furniture, these old school TVs. And, yeah. he, and he was in a band. He played the accordion. 
And so I used to travel around with him when he would go do TV repair. And I just thought it was super cool that all these people yeah. thanked him. He won community awards and he kind of, you know, so, so that was interesting to me at, a, at five years old. And then I played sports and you couldn't really just get a job if you wanted to have extra money and play sports because it would interfere with, you know, exactly. games and all that kind of stuff. So I just had this little side business of detailing cars because my mom worked at a credit union and I detailed the repossessed vehicles. My dad worked at a coal mine. And when the bosses came into town, I helped him clean up some of the surface vehicles. And that kind of launched that initial career. And then in the summer, I could work really hard. And then during, yeah. you know, sports season, I could kind of take it off. Man, we got a lot of parallels. I'm a licensed insurance agent. I've been licensed since I was 20 years old. I'm 44 today, uh, 45 uh, in two weeks. But I always, you know, I, I thought to myself, does my entrepreneurial hunger or spirit come from the lack of? Many, you know, my first memory of life was living in a battered women's shelter, was homeless, made a lot of bad decisions in life. You know, I sold candy in elementary school um, so, and I always had a hustle. I always had a side hustle. And ultimately, even as a teenager, you know, you don't know what you don't know. I made a lot of bad decisions. Uh, I wrote the book From the Hood to Doing Good. And it talks about, you know, me being, you know, a young drug dealer and and having a felony arrest, a felony arrest as a teenager. And people ask me, you know, where does that entrepreneurial spirit come? come from and I, I look back at it and I and, and I want to give you know this poetic answer but I don't really know if it was because the hunger of the lack of or was it you know my father who was a garbage man would wake us up at 5 a.m. in the morning we'd go pick up cans before he went to work you know what I mean he had a side hustle he you know he, he used to run the numbers so I, I saw side hustles and funny enough, the guy that I'm named after, Johnny Wimbry, my uncle, he was the first African-American in Fort Worth, Texas to have a franchise um, and he called it JW Cream. It's kind of like a Dairy Queen, but he called it JW Cream. And I just remember being in awe of him and having his name created an obligation. I mean, this guy carried the Olympic torch in 1996 when it went through America. So. So, I mean, to follow someone like that, like you're talking about your grandfather. So, you have this hunger, you have this passion, you obviously are, are a major hustler. You got people who are listening and watching right now that wanna make that first step. What would you tell somebody that has a desire and they don't really know the first step to take? Well, I'll give them like an equation that I think is super helpful. Well, I like um, equations, let's yes. go, I love it the value equation. So like, if you want to make more money, it's all about adding more value, but people are confused about how to add more value. First obstacle we face is people discount their abilities. Yeah. They don't think they have enough to offer because they feel unworthy or they don't feel like whatever they do is unique. And so all of a sudden they just sit there and worry and confused. So the, there's two things that drive financial capital. The first one's our mental capital. It's ideas, knowledge, wisdom, you know, resources, strategies, insights. And then if we take our relationship capital, which is the people, networks, organizations, customers, family, friends, with bridge between those two things is business. And that bridge, if you want to make more money, comes down to serving others, solving big enough problems, and delivering value. And the byproduct is going to be money. So dollars follow value. So how do you create more value? You've got to discover your mental capital. What out there in the world are people struggling with, suffering from, dealing with that they can't figure out? And we got a lot of that out there in the world. There's tons of people that are struggling, that don't have insight, that not sure what to do, that it's not what they're uniquely gifted for. And so it really comes down to who you spend your time with and the type of value that you deliver to those people. And so your first step is you've got to learn how to truly invest in yourself and expose that skill set. And the second step is you've just got to find one quality relationship. One amplifier relationship changes someone's life. One person that will be your advocate, one person that will promote you, one person that will invest in you. And when I was 19 years old, people are going, oh, this is a kid. They're willing to pay it forward. So I yeah. love that my, my age. You, people used to tell me, oh, you can't do that. You're too young. I'm like, actually, it's because I'm young that I have an advantage over other people. And right now, there might be people saying, oh, I'm too old. If that's what you're saying, you're always going to find those things. So the, the reality is you've got to look for what you can do versus what you can't do. You've got to refine whatever you know and you've just got to find one catalyst one connector one amplifier relationship and it will transform your entire life man hold on i heard everything you said but i promise you bro i was stuck on this wall when you said amplify relationship 
one amplifier relationship can literally change the t trajectory of your entire life. That amplifier relationship for, for me was Les Brown. Me being able to serve Les Brown, be willing to carry his bags through the airport, being able to serve. I mean, pe people don't really, I mean, this drives me nuts because teaching this concept is, is not as easy as it sounds because it sounds too easy to believe. It sounds too simple. I carry the bags of individuals through airports who are where I want to be. That one amplified relationship has turned into over $30 million in international profits, not just international business, international profits, because I maximize an amplified relationship. Bro, you got me gassed up on that, man. And I, you know, we know I'm sure a lot of the same people, but one of the people that we know on a global scale, I've traveled with him around the world. I've written books with him. Matter of fact, he's right here. You've written books with him. Uh, my good friend, uh, I call him the, the the Richard Branson of Australia, the Greek Australian certified astronaut, uh, Nick Halleck. Um, you guys co-authored a book together, I believe, um, uh, The Five Day Weekend? Yeah, man. I'm right here. Five Day Weekend. <laughs> I'm actually in the book. I actually, uh, I actually do a blurb in the book. But um, when he was launching the book, we did an Australian tour called the five-day weekend. So the first ever five-day weekend tour that he ever did, um, I was the keynote. Um, I don't even remember if he spoke a lot. He basically built the seminar around me because I've, I've been in the travel space, I've been in the entrepreneurial space, and you know my concept is you know I teach people how to start winning and buying their life back, and that was the concept. How do you turn a two-day weekend into a five-day weekend? Um, and that lights me up, brother. So you are, are, are you, I know you're the owner of Wealth Factory. So if they want to find you, it's wealthfactory.com. Are you the founder of Wealth Factory as well? Yeah, I'm a partner. I'm the majority partner. Okay, tell me about that. Yeah, so Wealth Factory came really from the year 2000. I created a firm called Ingenuity, but with an E. So Ingenuity with three other partners. And our whole concept was when I was going on that 26 month, like to figure things out, I found these young guys. And yeah. they were inquisitive. They were curious. They were asking questions. They were challenging the status quo. So we formed like an intellectual partnership and we started to build out these things like the producer revolution, which was a, a monthly kind of uh, series where people were working on their mindset. We'd send them a daily email. We'd send them a monthly audio right. back in the CD days of interviewing someone. Right. We yeah. host these producer forums once a month. And so we built some cool things together, but two of them died in a plane crash back in 2006. Um, so they, they were foundational in building ingenuity. But when that happened, I had to create something that was, a springboard from that called Freedom Fast Track. So Freedom Fast Track was this program to give people like some of the same resources that the ultra affluent have, like what's known as a family office, which is a comprehensive financial team. I wanted to build that for the entrepreneur that wasn't worth 50 million or more. I wanted to build it for the entrepreneur that had a lot of their assets in their business, that had all this potential, but they didn't have the right information to keep more of the money they made. And so I built that. And then in 2014, there was someone selling their business that had done an amazing job. They had educated 50,000 people online that had bought their program and was like kind of moving on because finance wasn't their expertise. But yeah. They had an amazing team and they had this digital portfolio. So when I bought that, we turned Freedom Fast Track into Wealth Factory. And with that came a CMO that I made a business partner and also a, a copywriter that was our chief copywriter. And then my chairman who'd been working with me for years, the four of us formed Wealth Factory, which is really just a continued evolution of what I started in 2000 with those original partners, right? So, yeah. so Wealth Factory is really about helping people achieve economic independence, keep more of what they make, build a legacy that lasts, and really be focused on cash flow and quality of life where most financial firms are focused on destroying quality of life in the name of retiring one day, which I'm really against both of those things. Mm, wow, so you know, wealth is a big word for me. Uh, this show is called Masters of Wealth. And the reason I teach more on wealth concept, because to me, wealth sounds like something that you pass on. It sounds generational success. You know, you can win one race and be successful, but you can't pass that on. Why is wealth important to you in terms of your personal definition? What is your definition and why is it important? So being rich and being wealthy are two different things. Rich is simply having a lot of money, yep. which is great. But being wealthy to me comes down to five dimensions or five tracks. The first one is finance. You know. It, to be wealthy, if you don't have a lot of money, it's like air. There's not much around. It's suffocating as hell. The second thing is purpose. 
Like purpose is a huge part of wealth because it keeps you engaged in life and you're up to something. The third one is mentality or mindset because that's the perspective in what you view the world. And if you come from a perspective of abundance and production and profit versus scarcity and worry and fear, then you're going to feel wealthier. And then health is a huge part of wealth because if you don't have your health, you really don't have anything. And then finally, the social aspect of wealth, which is relaxation, rejuvenation, and recreation. So you're living this high quality of life and living wealthy along the way. So it's really about those five aspects and having depth in those. Money, purpose, mindset, health, and social. And to me, that's wealth. It doesn't mean being perfectly balanced in that because balance can lead to stagnation and it's almost impossible. It's just that you're choosing it and it's harmonious because it's consistent with who you are. You yeah. lead by example and you live it. And the way that you pass it on is showing other people how to live the life that they love, embrace who they are, and make sure that they get these things dialed in. And wealth is passing on money, but it's also passing on values and contribution and principles and philosophies and how we live along the way. Man, that's... That's insane, bro. You know, I've interviewed a lot of people and I've been interviewed a lot around the world as I travel. I knew you were about to let loose when you said five things. That's why I laugh. I said, he's about to lay in on us, man. I love the fact that when people have their own definition of wealth, that is their ownership of their personal definition. What I would challenge individuals who are listening right now is you come up with your definition and own that definition, be faithful to that definition, and participate in what you say the definition is. I agree with everything you said. I have no problem with anything that you said because I truly believe that wealth begins within. I believe, you know, I, I've coached a lot of celebrities and there are a lot of celebrities that people see on TV that we love them more than they love themselves. That's not wealth. Wealth is not a bank account. It can be an ingredient. It can be an ingredient. You know, if, if, if I say chocolate cake, I'm not saying sugar, but I am saying sugar. And that's how, that's, how, that's how I feel about wealth. When I say wealth, it's just, you know, success and money is just one ingredient. My definition of wealth is being able to do whatever I want to do, whenever I want to do it, as much as I want to do it, until I'm done doing it, and I don't have to ask for permission to start or finish. And what I mean by that is I own my schedule. I own my life. And I busted my ass to create that, but that is true freedom for me. If my children have something, I can be there without moving backwards. As a matter of fact, created a life where my, my income, if you want to call it that, follows the sun, which means 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And in some way, I'm generating revenue, but I didn't get there overnight. It was a process and I interviewed uh, Grant Cardone two weeks ago and we talked about something super similar that what you just shared and one thing that I love to find out is it's the why behind it your why and you just did that man Garrett so if you had a couple pointers maybe two to five whatever it is of things that you can share with people right now who want to get access to who you are and what you have and I love your heart you know we've all heard this people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care the reason I team up with people like you, and I, I, I do business with a lot of people that I wouldn't consider teaming up with. And I'm okay with that, I'm a businessman. But the reason I team up with people like you is because I look for heart. I look for heart, like why is it important for you to teach people how to become wealthy in the wealth factory? Yeah, man. That drives me, man. Be like. So my great grandfather in 1913 leaves this little tiny town called San Giovanni in Fiore in Italy. And his wife is pregnant. The reason he leaves is because they can't afford to put food on the table. Like we hear people say that in America today, but dude, the government will put food on the table for people at this point, right? It's not that hard. But back then he had the mob that was close to San Giovanni and he also had the government doing excess of taxation. And so he gets on a boat. Now he lives in this, like it's a very hilly country. I went there last year. And so somehow he walks, he gets, I don't know how he gets to this place that's close down by um, Sicily. And he takes off on a boat, right? He's got this stuff called uh, mozzasola, which is just this honey bread that hardens and it won't spoil just so he has enough food. Then he gets to Ellis Island, not speaking English. And they change his last name because they don't understand him. 
Then he gets on a train and he comes all the way out to Utah because he heard some Greeks and Italians were here and they were making money in coal mining. But when he gets here, there's this disaster. There's this coal mining fire. It kills a bunch of people and a bunch of the mines shut down. So he becomes a goat herder until the mines reopen. Takes him seven years to save up enough money to actually get into a home and outside of a tent, right? Because no bank's lending this dude money. So he has to save up enough cash to buy a home, a meager home, and then get his wife out here from Italy. And he meets his daughter for the first time when she's seven years old. And here's wow. the bottom line. Hard work with the wrong philosophy can lead to separation. Hard work with the wrong philosophy, you could end up living in a tent. And the bottom line is he didn't know the principles of prosperity, but he made a bold move to improve his family's life. Now, I wanted to pick up that torch and say, how do I make sure that that family builds a life they love instead of lives in fear and scarcity? Because when you're separated, that creates kind of like generational concern, right? You're like, hey, we better hold on to everything we have. Yeah. A form of scarcity and holding scarcity. on. Scarcity. Right. So I'm saying, no, no. Great. Let's think about what we could do to really have an amazing life, to really invest in ourselves and build something we never want to retire from because we're engaged in the world. And that's what I'm bringing to my family. And I look at so many people out there that are first generation entrepreneurs and they feel that same pain. They have that same story to mm -hmm. some degree as my great grandfather without the right information, support, team, structure, insights. Then what they do is they work their life away, never quite getting where they wanted to go, always kind of on the horizon. And that's just, to me, that's, that's sad and it's destructive. And I'm yeah. passionate about changing that trajectory for people. Man, your your why is so defined. I'm listening to you, man. I, I'm falling in love with your grandfather, and 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 and, and I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying this um, in any exaggeration. I saw a movie as you were talking. Like I'm literally seeing because you have the ability to paint words. Word, I call it word art when I'm when I'm training professional speakers, and you just did it on a masterful level. Here's what came to me when you were talking. A lot of people make decisions based on the fact that they can't afford to move into something. I can't afford to move into entrepreneurialism. I can't afford to take this step. Your grandfather said, I can't afford to stay. That's the movie. I can't afford to stay. There's so much in that message that rocks the foundation of my soul, man. Dude, he didn't know. When he left, like my, my great grandma, I never see, I, my entire life, I've never seen someone more worried. She took a Valium every day. She was filled with anxiety. So I, I decided to ask my great uncle, I'm like, how in the world did my great grandfather get my great grandmother here from Italy? He goes, they, she lived in such scarcity. He said, I've paid for your trip. And if you don't get on the boat, we lose the money. Because I just can't imagine her getting on a boat. I never saw her leave the couch. And when we drove away from her home, we had to call to let her know we got there safely because she worried until she knew we wow. were in the house. So you, you think about it like this dude took such a bold action, not knowing whether he was yeah. going to see his wife ever again. They didn't have the internet. They're writing letters hoping they get back there, right? And yeah. might not hear for months at a time. Like I can't even imagine the stress, the pressure, and the level of like want to provide a better life. How many people out there have that deep desire to provide a better life? They just don't know what to do. They just feel stuck and therefore they're feeling depressed and the world gets robbed of their ability. The world gets robbed of it and they get robbed of their own joy and happiness. And I'm just taking a stand against that, that no longer do people have to let money be an obstacle. No longer does scarcity have to rule or govern their life because I think we have massive problems in the world today. Massive problems, but I think we have the people to solve it. They just don't understand money. They just don't understand prosperity. And mm -hmm. so they stay in a place where it's hidden to the rest of us. And it improves all of our lives if we unlock that. Man, I love it. Wealth Factory's mission is to manufacture economic independence for 1 million entrepreneurs by 2020. And it is 2020. Yeah, man. So we're on, tr we're, we're on a track, but do we have a million people that we could measure at economic independence? No, but five years ago I said, we've got to change the game. We just got to change what we're up to. We got to think it. about something beyond our reach. So we have to collaborate. So we have to coordinate so that we have to say, hey, if we don't have the resources, who does? If we don't have the bandwidth, who does? We don't have the ability. We've just got to be the ones willing to speak it and inspire because 
think about the rippling effects of a million people. Yeah. Like right now, we know that we're directly impacting 150,000 people on a daily basis. But the reality is those 150,000 people represent other people. They're entrepreneurs that employ other people. So when we said 2020, I, I was okay like saying it. Yeah. I don't know if we've done it, but I'm here to commit to it till the day I hit the grave. I love it, baby. I love it, man. I love that. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say something. You just made me think about something that I've said from stage before. And when I say this, I want you to respond like the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, and, I, and I'm doing this to serve the listeners, uh, to serve the, uh, the viewers. 97% of the world works for the 3% that refuse to be them. 97% of the world works for the 3% that refuses to be them. What does that say to you? Well, this is completely intentional because two people designed it that way. John Dewey that created the modern educational- uh, People are gonna think this is a setup question. He had no idea I was gonna ask that. No. I'm ready, let's go. So John Dewey wanted to, there to be 80% of people that go to school, just they finish school and they're just taught how to work for someone else. 17% would drop out and they would take the lowest level jobs that nobody else wanted to do. And then 3% would actually be the ones that hired that workforce. The second thing is Edward Bernays. Edward Bernays is Sigmund Freud's nephew. And Edward Bernays invented consumerism in the state that we see it today. And the main initiative was how can we keep people busy so they don't think and they just get into this activity and then we get them to consume things so they consistently have to be on that hamster wheel and that treadmill of just working to get more. But the more they get, the less fulfilled they feel because they're not thinking for themselves because it's consumptive success versus true success defined by society, not defined by the individual. So those two factors were completely designed and executed with near perfection. And so we have to get outside of that system to invent something. And if we don't, we get stuck in that system thinking it's just about working harder and it's all going to pay off. But the wrong hard work just keeps you trapped. You know, I, I can eat, sleep and breathe that kind of stuff. When you can peel back the layers of how we got here, I'll, I'll go to a seven day seminar with you just to talk about stuff like that. At the turn of the 1900s, the turn of the century in the 1900s, 90% 90, 90 of America was entrepreneurs. Yeah, we had all these immigrants that came with nothing building resourcefully, <laughs> the renegades of the world. It was phenomenal. 90% at the turn of the century in the year 2000 are entrepreneurs. They implemented the education system. The banking got behind the education system and we became these, you know, um, I don't want to say puppets, if you will, but we became so protected by an institution that was introduced to give, to give us this feeling of safety. And that feeling of safety has created a ripple effect of people just being okay with being comfortable. Yeah. Program scarcity. I dig it, man. Listen. This is the Master of Wealth Show with Johnny Wimbry. Right now I'm interviewing Garrett Gunderson. He is the founder um, and the creator of wealthfactory.com. Um, I always, when I interview people, I say, go check them out. I always endorse it. If you're on my show, I think it's the right thing to do. I haven't done it yet. Maybe there will be a day where I'll say, don't ever go look at this person. <laughs> I'm crazy enough to say that. But I am saying with 100% certainty, I endorse Garrett Gunderson's message 100%. And for those of you who really have a desire and a passion to have increase, you know, my message is about increase because increase is emotionally, physically, whatever it is. It's just saying, hey, listen, I'll take a step forward. And that's what I really want to get in the, conscious, the mind of the conscious of, the, of individuals. Just will you just participate in daily steps forward to where you say you want to be in life? And I'm telling you, if you say you want to be successful, you want to be wealthy, you need to go to wealthfactory.com right now. I, I endorse your message, brother. I endorse your passion behind your message. My fear is that it won't be duplicated. You understand what I mean? My fear is the passion that you have, how do you duplicate that in other people 
to run with the same message with the same passion that you have yeah i mean so we hired like just to, an example two examples so we hired this guy chris smith right so chris smith owns a company called campfire effect and i brought him in to do a, a training with my team and the reason he was there was to uncover their why and how it connected to why they existed inside of our firm right yeah. and in that we saw some people didn't really belong and uh, then I brought another guy, Bill McKernan, that wrote this book called One Last Talk, which is finding like what's within someone there that if they share would be a massive impact, but they're scared to share with the world. And we had him do a full day where we're just immersed with our people and really discovering like where their obstacles, where their limitations. And, you know, so as, as I look at the people that are inside of our firm, like this girl, Demi, so Demi's a wealth engineer, like she invests in herself so heavily that I tease her about it because she just loves what she does. You know, Tim is one of our financial architects. He's so much smarter about finance than I am. It took me 15 years to recruit that guy to come work for us and now he loves it, right? So I think it's one of the more difficult things to do. Um, but it's one of the things that I pride what we, you know, what we do. And, and part of the problem is some people have been in our organization in the last 20 years that j they want to be there because of the culture, because of the energy. Yeah but they didn't really have the ability to deliver. And so those are some of the hardest moments I've had was letting those type of people go because the bottom line is I only want people that this is their passion, this is their purpose. This is like, we had a guy, like we're looking for people like who's nerdy enough that they want to be dealing with estate planning all day or who's nerdy enough yeah. that they want to talk about property and casualty insurance in a way that I talk about wealth here. And we found a guy that when he was nine years old was looking stamps for his dad in an insurance agency. We found another guy at 11 years old, he was sitting in meetings with his grandfather as his grandfather was meeting with guys like Walt Disney, Frank Sinatra, because they were his clients. We look for those people, the nerds of nerds, and make sure that it's something that like, they would talk about it in the, like no matter who wanted to talk about it, no matter what time, if it was 3 a.m. and they were exhausted, someone mentioned some topic like that, they would be on it, right? That's what we look for. And we yeah. have to move on from those people if they don't keep that up. We had a guy that we thought was passionate about disability insurance, which is strange to be passionate about, but he started doing tax liens. I'm like, cool, man, you're not into disability insurance, you're into something else. You're out of our network. So that's what we look for. Is a way to be perfectly duplicating it? I don't know. But I, I want people that look at themselves as an artist even more than they look at themselves as an entrepreneur. An artist in an area that needs art like finance, right? In a place that could be dry, drab, monotone, and boring and make sure they have some family connection or why in their life, just like I do in mine. Man. You know, there's an ancient writing that says, in the multitude of counsel, there is safety. And I typically read things almost like it's a riddle. So what it's not saying is, where you don't have counsel, you're not safe. And I think the information that you're providing, the courses, the atmosphere that you're providing, and what you have built, like with your staff and your team members, it seems like you thought this thing out. Like, uh, you know, I'm going to build something that keeps me safe, keeps my clients safe as we're moving forward. Um, I want to end with this. I heard you say this um, from stage. You said, um, and you can correct me if I don't remember it uh, 100%, but you said that if you want to have a portfolio in the stock market of $2 million, I mean, of, of, uh, of $2 million, no, you said, if you want to have a portfolio in the stock market of a $1 million, you got to start with $2 million. What the hell, bro? That's scary. And, and and let me tell you why that shook me. I've seen with my own eyes negative one million dollars in my portfolio. That hurts because I what I didn't I, I didn't surround myself around the thinking that outthinks me. I wasn't protected. I didn't have the counsel. And this is what I want people to understand. I've seen a negative million dollars in my portfolio in the stock market. What are you doing for individuals? to keep them protected in that, in that type of atmosphere. Yeah, so we don't do assets under management at my firm, which any consultant thinks is insane because we walk away from a boatload of money. But the second we get paid on those things, we create an immediate conflict of interest and we can't be part of due diligence because all we are at that point is part of transactions. So I'll give an example. The year's 2008, I meet this guy who, his company's done 11 billion in sales over its life at that point pretty well-known brand and we're just having breakfast, but he's stressed out. And I'm like, why are you stressed out? He goes, my 401k is lost, 
25, almost 30%. And I'm like, how much do you have in your 401k? He goes, a million bucks. I used to, he said, I go, okay, you got to be worth a lot more than that, right? Like, I don't know, yeah. let's just guess. Let's say it's $100 million that he's worth. I'm like, so what we're seeing is his overall net worth, like he's lost 3% of 3%. I mean, it's like such a minuscule amount that he's lost overall, right? right? right. Yet, it's occupying 90% of his stress. So I asked a few questions. I found out a few things. Number one, his home had been featured on Oprah because of how it was designed. I'm like, well, that's pretty cool. And he knew how to design these types of properties that were super high end, but very efficiently. And, they, and I was like, okay, number two, he had owned an Andy Warhol painting before, but he sold it early to manage cash flow properly. Mm -hmm. That thing's worth eight and a half times more now. The third thing is he knew how to buy wine. He just knew a lot about wine. So I said, hey, why is it you're not investing more in unique property, in wine, and in art? And he goes, well, because my broker doesn't talk about those things. I'm like, right, he's broker than you, first off. And second, like, you can't get paid a commission on those things. And this is my assessment. Number one, never liquidate something that you know is valuable because you have a cash crunch because you had a million dollars in your 401k. He goes, yeah, but there's a 10% penalty. I said, that 10% penalty was small compared to the appreciation you lost on the Warhol painting. It was pennies on the dollar. Mm -hmm. I said, and by the way, if I was willing to give you a loan, charge you 10% the first year, and never charge you interest forevermore, would you take that loan? He goes, exact, yeah, for sure. I'm like, well, that was your 10% penalty. Who cares? And by the way, there's a thing called 72T where he could have got the money out or part of it out without the 10% penalty. So he just didn't know about it, right? And then I said, hey, you got this wine. Let's say you buy it wrong and it's a recession. Just drink through it, bro. You'll be happier. You know, it was just a little bit of a joke I was telling him. But ultimately, I gave him permission about his investor DNA. What are his values? What are his competencies? What drives him? And focus there rather than diversify into things he didn't understand. When we diversify away from things we know, we diversify. And that's not where wealth is built. Diversification is when you've already achieved a high level of wealth, not for the path to get wealthy. And people are using the wrong methodologies. But Andrew Carnegie said he put all of his eggs in one basket and watch it like a hawk. I believe in that. Focus over diversification, invest your DNA, and protect your downside. If you're putting your money in the market, you don't know why that would work, how it would work, when it would work. You're speculating and gambling, not investing. Damn, dude. That's so good, man. You are a walking, talking master of wealth. <laughs> I love it. I love it, man. Um, you're cracking my brain a little bit because you're, you're reminding me of how much I don't know. And you know, one of the things that I've always prided myself in is I'm okay with copying the best of the best. I'm okay with learning from people. And you know, I would like to say my success comes from the fact that I'm coachable on the spot. Like as you're talking to me, I'm making decisions right now. I don't have to go study. I don't have to go do research. When I find individuals like you, I'm listening, bro, and I'm going to start implementing immediately some of the things that you just talked about. And, you know, one of the things is I want to invest more in my passions. I want to invest more in things that are fun to me. You, you, you talk about like having art. You talk about, you know, things like I love seminars. So I'm thinking to myself, why am I not investing in other people's seminars? I know how to do them. I love talking about them. I love the results of them. And I know people who can't, you know, who don't know how to do it. They have great content, but they just don't know how to do seminars. I'm thinking to myself like, why am I not investing in seminars? That's great, man. That's a huge insight. Dude, I appreciate you, man. Garrett Gunderson, brother. I give you the official seal of approval of being a wealth master. Thank you, my man. That was fun. <laughs> appreciate it. Glad to have you on the show, brother. Um, if people want to um, contact you on social media, can they find that uh, at wealthfactory.com or do you want to share it right here? I, I, if you put in your internet browser, Garrett.live, it'll take you to my YouTube channel. I do five videos a week. I actually respond to the comments on YouTube. I don't really do much with Facebook or you know Instagram, Instagram. or Twitter or any of that kind of stuff, but I do respond on YouTube and I'm putting out a lot of content all the time or you can just you know, go into YouTube, put my name, Garrett Gunderson, and subscribe. There it is, brother. I appreciate you, man. Thank you for being on the show. Uh, Johnny Wimbry, as always, we're going to bring the Masters of Wealth. Um, you get my official seal of approval, brother. You are a master of wealth. Go check them out at thewealthfactory.com. It's an honor and a pleasure uh, to have you here, man. Travel safe. I know you got a big schedule ahead of you for 2020. God bless.
Thanks for listening to Masters of Wealth. To find out more about Garrett, hit him up on his YouTube page, at Garrett Gunderson, where he posts five new videos every week. Or check out his website at www.wealthfactory.com. To learn more about Johnny, check out his Instagram, at Wimbrey, that's W-I-M-B-R-E-Y. And follow him on Facebook, at facebook.com slash Johnny Wimbrey. And to hear more episodes of Masters of Wealth, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcasting platform so that you can be the first to hear new episodes every single week. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.